So I just want to tell you this, this breakout group is a little bit different than the others because two of the issues that we're going to talk about are the, um, is preparing for the webinars on the standard of dance and on the spill issue. And so the purpose of our discussion on those is to try and get the questions that you want to be sure are answered in the webinar so that that can help us figure out what options and recommendations the task force can make on those two very important, very contentious issues. So we're going to spend a little bit of time brainstorming on those two things, and then we do have some other recommendations we want to try and talk about and get guidance from you on how you'd like those to shape up, and those have to do with um, dams and fish barriers, <coughs> dams that um, have been prioritized for removal, and um, on the um, expedition of the NEPA process. So we'll get to those um, next, but I just want you to know we're saving time for that. So we're going to try and go this, through this as quickly as we can. But we, uh, so first of all, let's just start out with the Snake River Dams. That's the, the one that um, I know there's a lot of interest in, and we've had a lot of task force questions on that. These eight questions here are the ones, um, a short list of the ones that we've heard so far from task force members, so we can use that. Um, to build on, Steve, just want to run through those really quick. Yes, thank you, Susan. So, um, th these are the abbreviated versions of the roughly nine or eight questions that the steering committee and others have teed up to help inform the task force to liberate on this particular action, i.e., reaching a four or lower snake per dam. And it's very specific to those four particular facilities. The build out of question number one, which is abbreviated here on the chart, is um, if the lower snake per dams were breached, what are the projected benefits to wild Chinook abundance? Question mark. How long would it take for those benefits uh, uh, for wild Chinook abundance to occur once the dams were removed? So it's, there's two questions folded in there. Essentially, how many more wild Chinook would there be and how long would it take to get there? So what we want to go through is a list of these questions for the task force to ask you, are these the right questions that would help you deliberate and develop an informed recommendation on this particular isolated action? Do we need to wordsmith that? Yes, question. So that's, I, I put that one in the seat. So, um, and one of the things, I just want to harken back to what Jacques, Jacques White said earlier. This is really kind of about Chinook units. Um, a lot of the information that we've been getting um, has been talking about how to do it, who could do it, why it should be done. But what we haven't seen are actual data. And then we got this uh, letter uh, from uh, Robert Montgomery and a bunch of other scientists that is the first thing that I've seen that has and it has percentages of increase, but it doesn't actually have some Chinook numbers in there. While I have the floor, just one quick second, I was also interested in what I don't see up there is the combination of the dam removals and increased spillover, because that I think is the more connected than we've been talking about. So that will be the subject of the first seminar, or webinar, will be the fish response to increased spill, or Yes, whatever that shakes out to be. I'm just saying that I think there's a synergy there that we, and so in discussing this independently, we might lose some of that synergy, one versus the other. So. Do you have any sense of which one, which webinar should come first? I, I don't think it matters. That doesn't matter. I just think okay. as long as we remind ourselves that they're interconnected. We're and okay. so making sure that we talk about spill when we talk about snake over right. and, and Exactly. Okay. <coughs> sorry, uh, sorry for the So sorry, go ahead. So the comment that we received on this one, uh, based upon the prior comment, <coughs> in terms of uh, units, explicit numbers of fish, not SARs or percent survival or reach survival or facility, but actually abundance of adult Chinook of wild origin in the Alps of the state for days. That's where I'm understanding your question. Right. Thank you for submitting that question. Thank you so much. Right, so the second question is the preview up here is what impact would occur to the current hatchery production? The larger version of that question is would increases in wild Chinook abundance due to dam breaching result in an overall increase in Chinook abundance for southern resident killer whale relative to the recent tenure average of hatchery and wild Chinook abundance combined if there were no more hatchery production? So the question here is if there's no more hatchery production as a result of no more requirement of communication, that's the assumption that it could be false, but that's the assumption. Would the wild Chinook abundance overcome the current 10 year geo mean of wild and hatchery combined? Yes, sir. Are these 
discussion is going to be just directly related to the damage rules, or do we really have discussions about pet reproduction or wild fish production outside of? I think we certainly can. This one happens to be very specific to the single action of reach for lower Snake River Dam. So we're trying to keep it really narrow because the conversation has been going on for 25 years. And it, we have to frame some questions because you're on a very tight time frame. This is a very important and sensitive topic. And I think the task force both deserves and has to have very explicit information to deliver and make a meaningful recommendation. That's my perspective. So just Terry, I would actually say about the same thing. I think I think we need to get to Joe's point, better clarification. Because I have got numbers in front of me showing like four times more fish coming out of the Columbia, out of the Columbia the, 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 the Snake River Dam pond, right? So is that accurate? And if it is, then let's have that discussion. I, it's funny. I say is that accurate? Some people nodded and some people shook their head. So that's my problem. I didn't know what numbers am I basing that on. And so I think this task force before you know November needs to have some sort of recommendation on the dams. And if we don't, I think we're really missing the beat. And so, and because it's such a controversial political issue, I think spending some time just focused on that is important. I think we also need to have a very important discussion on hatcheries and then on habitat. All today. <laughs> so, oh, if we could just let Steve get through the yeah. questions and then we can come back <laughs> and see if you want to add to them, edit them, that sort of thing. So Steve, just to clarify, so question number two is asking the question, if we remove the dams, there would be no there would be no hatchery production in the snake river. Is that the assumption? That's no, I guess that's so the assumption. That what, I think that's the assumption to this question. I think that assumption is tested because I doubt that's true, but I don't know that. Okay. I, think, I think it's asking the question what are the impacts, which is does production stop? Is it right? So it's basically we have production now that's hatchery production. When the dams go away, that may go away. Therefore, can wild make up for the hatchery? Absolutely, that's exactly that's the question. Okay. Yeah, there's currently a snow lower snake river compensation time uh, program funded by DP of $8 to mitigate the impacts of lower snake river dams. It produces about 15 million Chinook, costs about $30 million a year, just as context for the conversation. And then there are other facilities upstream that are there to mitigate the impacts of impassable dams that lie just upstream. So yeah, so let's Steve get through these quickly and then we'll come back and go through them. So, so here's the answer to Amy's question right there. Jacques asked it out there about the numbers. So the sub-question to this is, and you don't need to write with the conversation, if wild Chinook won't equal or exceed the current abundance of hatchery plus wild, then what hatchery production would need to be funded by who in order to make up that loss that were previously provided as mitigation of dams? So, in other words, the question here is, would there be a net loss of Chinook available to the killer whale without the hatches in place? Could there be an unattended? Do we know, as a collective body, what baseline we're using? So we say, is it is it adequate? Well, is it adequate for what the whales had in 1980, or is it adequate for what whales had in 1800? I mean, oh, so, so what is the baseline, and has it shifted? So if we're saying we need X amount of salmon, of Chinook salmon, are we basing that on what it was 20 years ago, or are we basing that on what it was 100 years ago? And, and so what's our baseline? That's, that's a great question. The question, the question, you know, the question here is, what is the status and trend of Snake River Chinook over the last 30 years? We know the lower Snake River Dam were built in the 50s, 60s. We've got a period of record that goes back at least 50. We could go beyond that because the first year the first one went in, there would have been no pre-dam impacts until the first year the first one went in. So I know there's estimates of historic runs of both of Chinook in the snake. That is a great question. Okay. Who has the authority? So yeah, I'm just making sure I edit the sub bolt number two, and I already mentioned that how many are produced and how much does it cost. Who has the authority to, there's two subparts, decommission the dams and or breach the dams because my, what I've been told, and I've been told a lot of things, there is an authority out there to decommission, stop operating the dams, that's one thing, but then there's the authority and perhaps the capital expenditures budget required to actually remove the earth portions. And I've heard there's authorities that lie somewhere in between. I've also been told by just an email this morning that if the dams were decommissioned, i.e. no longer generating hydropower, they would still have to be operating because that water is still coming. I'm assuming spill, uh, nav locks, gliders, et cetera. I don't know that. So the question is very simple. 
who has the authority to stop operating them, and who has the authority to actually reach? Is that a are those two questions that would help the task? Yes, absolutely. Yes. So number four is yeah, sub, sub question that one. Certainly. Would be the timing of exercising that authority. Is yeah. there a window Thank of you. time for that authority? From, uh, from, off, from authorization to final. I mean, LWA took for a long time. Yes, sir. I love those questions, but you know, probably the biggest grill in the room is if you think you can tear those dams down tomorrow without lawsuits and everything else, you're going to have to project how long that paperwork's going to get get through. These things aren't just, no matter how much we do, they'll come back. You've got to figure out what's the time frame for the lawsuits and all that. Some estimation. I mean, we talked for 30 years, so we talked in tight at the court I sit down with the PFMC council, you know, collab with the client with the tribe. Oh, okay. okay. So the Hoopa and the Europe, those have been, money has been in the bank for almost 20 years. Okay, and they're just finding out that there is no mitigation when those dams come down. The mitigation money stops. So now they're kind of rethinking how fast those dams should come down. So if you think these dams are coming down, even though we have people jump up through their read great stuff and hand out great information, are going to come down tomorrow without lawsuits and everything else that people are, their communities are made around because of those dams. I think we're fooling ourselves. So I wait. think those are the questions. I think that's a fundamental question that we have to ask. Them. So a question is just what are, what is the risk? What is the risk? What's the risk? All right, so um, the role of the BPA. Do you have a question about that? Do people want that question posed to the panel that's going to address these questions? I think I can combine it with number eight. Can put it all together in the deeper process. I, I, I would expand it. It's not just BPA. It's, it's, it's what's the role of different federal agencies and states. So it goes back to kind of who has the authority. Um, but I want to know the specific role of BPA versus EPA and the listings versus what else is in the NEPA process that we're not thinking Real about. And, and an example is the gentleman, God bless him, that spoke. The, the, the one guy I, I watched the oh, last yeah, week, yeah, yeah, you know, and, and he's somebody that that's benefiting from those dams, and they're probably just not going to go away. That's just one one person. Yeah, he was with the bar job. Right? There you go. Yeah, and put yeah. FERC in there too. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, okay. Okay. so that's what I'm saying. So when you read the list of each agency yeah. who has responsibility or each entity that has responsibilities, yeah. tribal governments as well. Uh, and then what the actual authority is, who's, who's making decisions? Well, I think this is important, not necessarily for recognition, but we're, remember we're also talking about timelines, do have short-term action, long-term action, and things like that. So I think it's really to know, is this a short-term action? This could be decades. Yeah, I mean, we, we need to know that. Is it a short-term or long-term type of action? Well, like, what's the timeline for which it comes? Exactly. So there's the process of the removal or breach, and then there's the process of recovery. Yes, we've got going on timeline. Steve, you mentioned at our last meeting that there's a lot of dams that are non-controversial that can be removed and we can get immediate fish back. Can we look at that list in, instead of this list? This <coughs> list is this is a federal issue that has been around for at least 25 years. We're not going to solve it at this task force. Okay. So we may make a recommendation, but I think we're spending a lot of time where we could be talking about removing barriers that are state in state control that we could actually do some good for getting salmon back. And we have that very issue on our committee <coughs> but we, we can get through these questions. Kind of a friendly amendment, Mark, to what you're saying. I don't think it's instead of. So I want to have this discussion. I think well, I don't want to burn up. up. Hang on. 15 days on this topic. Oh, totally. But what I'm saying is time. we've got to, as a task force, come up with a recommendation on the Snake River Dams, period. Right. And then we also need to have a serious conversation about culverts. We need to have a serious conversation about other impacts to watersheds and water systems that are dramatically impacting salmon. And so if we have a short list, and I know the Puget Sound Partnership and their action agenda has a list of some of the most adverse impacts associated with culverts and other things, let's put that as part of the same discussion. But we've got to have some sort of recommendation on this. We cannot walk away from it. So 
again, what we're doing right now is just the questions you want to answer in a webinar. We're not discussing whether it's a good idea or about any that's coming later. And we really do want to talk about those other dams later in this breakout session, and we only have an hour. So what we'll proportion of the feed for the whales in the time of year when they're hungry will these dams? That's number one. I think that's yeah. excellent. Okay. So that's, that's a subpart to this one. Well, so get that that's right more more specific. Yeah. There are times of year there's plenty of fish, and there are times of year there aren't. And if, if this is, are, are these the fish that are going to feed them when they're starving? And, uh, or do we need to start saving fish from the surplus fish to hatcheries and supplementing their feed in the short run uh, with, during that time of year that they're, they're starving in an interim time frame uh, so that we can keep them alive? And these are animals that are starving. Let's get realistic about yeah. this. There's, this was the last couple of years, for certain runs on the Columbia River, these were some of the largest runs we've seen in decades. So timing, run timing is very important. I think the status of the question is key to understanding the relationship there. I'm going to take that. The next question here is in regards to transportation and irrigation. And there's been speculation that those upgrades will be significant as an alternative to the barge traffic. And the question here is, uh, how much is that going to cost and who's going to respond? Is he responsible and how long will it take? I think those are reasonable questions as the task force considers this. Um, and then next to last here is about um, impacts of, renewable, of energy production. Uh, and then to replace that with carbon emitting energy sources or other alternatives. In other words, what's the CO2 equation look like absent the dams? And I think that information is quite readily available. We just need to know if that's the question you want and get the right answer for you. Uh, why have the prior NEPA? Oh, sorry, I apologize. Oh, did you jump over five? The impacts on transportation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I just got. Yeah, I kind of summarized by saying how much is it going to cost and who's going to take care of it. And all well, the transportation, I think, is a bigger issue than most things. Because with the barges going up and down, you take those dams up, and that's going to dump everything over on the trucks. For rail, for rail, and then or rail, but most likely trucks. And so, what is your carbon emission going to come off of that? You put more of that on. The highway system, what is the effect going to be on the highway system? So the transportation, I think, is a major one. Oh, thank you. We heard from the Board of Witness and Statistics. Yeah, well, it's capacity issue. Okay. So, um, so I was wondering, is there any Army Corps of Engineers experts in There's the room? There's no public comment in here. You can bring your questions and comment during the public comment period. Because so there's an expert in the room that knew If you're disrupting, you're going to be asked to leave. I'm sorry. I was so, just asking a question so if there's anybody in the room that might have uh, yeah. an, these are questions 35, that are going to be addressed in a webinar, okay? So that's not a time for discussion. Uh -huh. So task force members, do you have other things to add to this list of questions before you want to ask me about the spill so um, webinar? And there's two related to reference. I don't, I don't know how this would be addressed, but in some way the webinar, if there could be brought in uh, folks in the local communities that are engaged in this subject. I, um, I agree with Senator Rick, we need to make a statement about the St. River Dams and our recommendations in the first round. But in doing so, I think we need to at least entertain and acknowledge the interests of folks from local community in some fashion and hear from them and factor in their concerns or issues in, in our discussion. Wrong by local community, you mean the local communities on the St. River? Yeah, 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 thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's most definitely tribal land. Yeah. One other one, and I know in past studies of what they're removing the dam, it's been done for 25 years and probably going to go on for the next 75 years of the discussion. But also, when you remove those dams and the water flow drops down, then you're going to have major problems with the sides of the, of the river flowing in. And so, what impacts is it going to have on land use, roads, railroads, and everything else? When you remove that water, then you're going to have a swapping like that at all times. So there are going to be major impacts if you were ever to get to that point. And I think that has been studied in the past. So the last one that was presented to us to share back with you is why have the prior NEPA and EIS process is not concluded with reaching out to preferred alternative? And, and, and then to go on with that is, is to request an explanation of the ongoing one and what its timeline is. And I'd like to add, this is Kathy from Port on that if we are inserting a, a different species into that NEPA process, um, then once oh, we're there, oh. the, what's that mitigation? It, I mean, it's already existing 
litigation that's going through the court process right now. Adding an existing species, what does that do to that timeline? And what does Lord Dyke get us? You mean adding four for consideration? Yeah. Right, because I think that's what the context has been, so that's why I want to have to address that. Are there alternatives 
uh, technologies or mitigations for spilling more water through a different method that doesn't have the same. I mean, I think old tech water wheels didn't have the all gas problem, maybe the water was higher to the lower head. So, just uh, other, 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 other alternative technologies that yeah. can mitigate the adverse impacts of moving more water from above to below. We can have the core provided up in yard, you know, spillway deflectors, removable spillway deflectors, other alternatives to keep the water from spilling to create that we don't have to imagine that question now. Maybe. Are there, um, are the benefits that we see for the spill in the same, the same or commensurate for the spill in the same economy? Is it spill in the same thing for the bus, or is it spill in different systems so, that we So it's like site location benefit. And not just by dam, just sort of Columbia, Snake, upper, system. lower, I don't know, I don't know how to think about that. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Others? Uh, I'm curious, as you increase the spills, do you also lose um, power production? And where will that power production come from? So impact and also the power system and where the replacement comes from. Lowering those fills yeah. depending on the time of year that they <coughs> whatever it's lower than you take it down to, does it also affect the irrigation that's coming out of it and their transportation? The irrigation transportation. It may be that a lot of the questions we've asked are in the pipeline. Exactly. Yeah. Good point. So yeah, so we'll Okay. Can you get anything else? I just wonder if we've entertained spilling smarter. You know, in California, they we spill off the top. <laughs> spill off the top, you're spilling that same warm water that's on the top of those lakes, um, reservoirs. If you spill off the bottom, you start spilling colder water, which is also key for fish survival. Have we, have we entertained the thought or asked the question of what would we do? Um, how might it be better by spilling cold water instead of the warm water from the top of the dam? Um, they, once again, they're doing that. In fact, they distilled uh, water chillers behind dams in California because of the warm water. They <laughs> that's uh, that's uh, cut down on disease. And so uh, in the Columbia, if we're going to spill water, we might as well spill good water instead of spilling warm yeah. hot water. Uh, make the whole river hot down below the dam. So, great question. Appreciate it. Is there an option to still water? Okay. Anything else on that? Where are we going? Amy. To, to add to just kind of about spilling smarter, does that also have to do with wind during the day? Like are there there's lots of ways to think about still 24 hours a day, all the time, morning, evening, night? How do we think about the times of still for fish right. and for energy? Right. I know. And that is a key issue as, as hydro responds to wind power. And so, and so yeah. So I'm going to move on, if that's okay. The next one I think is really important, and we really want to try and get some resolution on the next steps on this today. This is the, the first issue in your discussion guide, and it's talking about removing other um, non state rivers. And the working group gave um, a series of options. Um, and they're listed here in the, in the table in your discussion guide. Um, supporting funding that currently is free to and supported gambling uh, projects across the state benefit each and those. There are some places that actually have um, gone through a process and have support but do not have money. Uh, developing a list um, of dams that are you know, the priority projects for potential removal as well as getting more information on the ones that have already been removed and what their benefit to salmon have been. The third one is halting dam projects that aim to address flooding on the Chehalis River and ask the state to pursue alternatives, ways to manage that problem. And then the fourth is to prioritize the removal of the dams. Um, American Whitewater has started the list, and then I think some task force members asked if WDFW actually prepare a prioritized list. Um, for folks, Ron Schultz of the Conservation Commission, for I'm uncomfortable with C because I know there's been quite an extensive process around that, and um, so what you say? And it, it's just having another entity come in from afar and, and say, um, come in, come in from afar and say, here's what we think you ought to be doing here in the Chehalis, even though they've been talking about it. Now, I, that's not to say that we shouldn't um, engage with them in some fashion and ask how they consider Chinook in the context of ORCA because I'm not sure that they have. I know they've talked about it in terms of, they talked about the dams in terms of flood control and addressing those issues. 
But I think going to them and saying, okay, put this in the context of the ORCA conversation, um, I think would be a healthy conversation to have. Uh, but to come in and take a position on a particular aspect of their work, I think is awkward. So would you so, rephrase that so instead of halting the damn projects to address that we ask, that, that the task force asks, so I think the Chehalis River groups need to come to us and explain to us exactly what the motivation is for this question being before the task force. I think we need to stay solely focused on recovery of the orca whale. The Chehalis River flooding situation is awful. I've been involved in it for 10 years since I got into the legislature. But um, I'm also concerned, and I'm not saying this is the case here, but whenever a task force or a group gets some traction, Every other group that wants their issue dealt with starts to say, oh, let's tag on our issue to their issue. And I want to make sure that we're staying solely focused on recovering the York whale. And so I need to hear from the folks in the Chehalis exactly what the Chinook benefit is from their situation if we do what they would like and if that's a recommendation. If there's not a clear benefit to hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands more Chinook coming out of the Chehalis and down into, the, into uh, Grace Harbor, then it's not on our agenda. And this also gets back to my point this morning. If we come in with 75 recommendations, I'm gonna go back to my colleagues in the legislature and they're gonna laugh in my face. So we need to come up with the top priority recommendations. And so I really question whether this is one of them or whether it should even be a question. So, yeah. I think it's a very important point. Yeah. We have chosen to reduce fish production by 160 million volts in the state. At Oregon in 30 million. So we made choices that have um, extra pressure on on the loss of that 160 million production. Sea lions have taken more of, 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 of the fish that the pork is worth. Plain and simple, we don't have we don't have production. So for example, I know you're a, you're an environmental guy. So on these bad ocean conditions, on these bad ocean conditions that we say we have the last couple of years, that's 750,000 less adult Chinook and coho salmon adults swimming around in our ecosystem. It's at an average ocean condition, which we're starting to get back to, that's 3.5 million. So I think it's an important that We've taken the production levels in all our basins, Puget Sound, Coastal Stream, okay. 60 million out of the Columbia River alone, and we're wondering why, what the hell we did. And that's just since 1992. This isn't, this isn't going back to prehistoric uh, grandpa days, uh, my grandpa anyway. This is, this is real time when everybody in this room was probably in high school or college or well into their careers. And so I, I think, in, we have to look at the, that whole system as affecting the killer whales because it has. I totally agree with you. And My I, point was no, no, I'm not arguing the point. I'm sorry, arguing that I'm not arguing that point. But but the Shehalis fish, the Willapaw fish, the Columbia fish, all contributed at one time to the killer whales and and, and the ecosystem of the ocean. For 12 years, we figured, well, we we got to change that. For whatever reason, actually fish terrible. You know, whatever we did, so we dropped the bottom out in a relatively short amount of time. And that's what's going on. I don't disagree with anything you're saying. My point is on the Chehalis and the Yakima, there's some other places where, you know, whiskey's for drinking, water's for fighting. I don't want us to get caught up in that conversation. Yeah, I want I to stay that. solely focused on orca whales and salmon recovery. And if that's the case, is the Chehalis dam discussion a real benefit for salmon? If it is, awesome, let's dive in. Uh, that's not my issue, but, but the, the ecosystem that we've dropped out of the production you know, is, is much. So let's talk about some of these other than the Shahela. So the takeaway, I think, on the Shahela is that we need more information on yeah. if it would really benefit workers and then figure out how to engage in that. And that's Topic. exactly what everything needs to have that lens of time and place. Yeah. And, and, and the first. All right. And if it doesn't belong here, it's not that we're not sympathetic, but it just gets ahead. Exactly. But if it proves through that that it's time and place, because the timing is important and the place is important, 
So it's point, point of question, just to yeah. sorry, Jeff. Okay, are, are you asking us to cross things off this list? Like, are we, are we gonna cross things off this right now? Well, we're gonna, I'd like I, to. yeah, we're going, we're going to, to, we're trying to refine this into a recommendation on these other dams that we can put in the draft report. Okay. So these three working groups, like this is a real one we're trying to refine into real language. So, and it may have sub parts. So what I'm hearing on the sub part, I'll show you, I think we've covered that. Supporting funding for currently existing and supported dam removal projects. Any objections to that? Thanks, Bill. Right. With the local project order, we have a process. We have funds requested to three different sources right now. We do not work on the guarantees, but the bill checks on the home system. We're looking for funding to remove that. We don't need this funding. Okay. Did you say, Susan, that because this is from the Air and Whitewater Group, that there was also a potential for the DFW? Wasn't another one. Right, so one of the recommendations to have the Department of Fish and Wildlife do an independent assessment of dams that have broad elements of park removal and have high benefit for Chinook in key areas. That's, yeah. that's, that's what it is. Yeah. That's so, what you guys have, revised. so just, just, is there support for that language that should be just that <coughs> the one that should stay on our list for consideration? Right. Yeah, I, I think there might be a, um, some efficiency here to combine D, D combined with A and B. In the sense that um, I'm guessing some of these things we are covered under A, that there is currently agreement they need funding, and then there's some of them that might be covered in D and B in terms of are they is there a list? My understanding is there's not a good list of dams that have good potential for removal, and to get to both Mark Thomas' point about can we just get to those things that we can do uh, and move that forward and get to Senator Ranker's point about can we get to identifying some things that we can go in the next session saying bang, 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 here's some stuff we can do. I, I think we can, by combining these, we can take a couple of So if we combine them, just let me make sure I get some of that. If we combine them, it's like get a prioritized list, support yes. funding for the top priority. Identify those ones that are top priority that have agreement and are ready to go. Okay. Just need the funding. Yeah, and, and, and the benefit, benefit there is all these would have a benefit amount of time. Yeah, and, then list, and then get the list. And then get the list. But those should have criteria, all. then get the list of those that are, have potential to be. Okay. Okay. Other thoughts? So, Brock, just a question. So, we had a conversation about C, uh, about the Shalos River. Uh, have we, has that been stricken from the person? What's no, the, the way process I, here? The way I, we'd well, like to have it removed. We're going to hear the other from the other, I mean, so we're not making. Okay, so the other group. Group. So for this report, I think it is to get more information on if there are real benefits to work with based on time and place. Mm -hmm. for Chinook, I, and, I, I'd like to propose that the C be stricken from the list as, as a priority for this year. Okay. Is there agreement on that? Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, and get, and in terms of the specific, I mean, it's very conclusive here to say Paul. Yeah. yeah. So I, I agree that that should be stricken. I do think we still need to uh, learn more about it. One of the things yeah. that uh, struck me about this is that uh, we've all been involved with efforts to try to restore parts of ecosystems here and there. And uh, I've heard lots of people complain about, oh, we just did this restoration project right here, and then you look next door, and an equal amount of habitat is destroyed by something else. So while we have to pay attention to scope and timeline, one thing I appreciated about this is it was saying, hey, while you're talking about removing these other dams, there are some proposed new dam projects, and you don't want to get in the business of spending hundreds of millions of dollars removing a dam and then building another dam and getting no net benefit. So I, so I think we do need, and we, we want to hear from the people what are the potential benefits, what are the potential impacts, but that's a phase two thing. Exactly. Joe. Yeah, I think Will makes a good point. I think if we go back to that letter A at the beginning, th this is not something that's going to bring back Chinook next year, right? And so it's something that we're thinking about as a long-term ecosystem change. And so as far as priorities that go, it's easy for us to come, I think it's easy for us to come forward to say, hey, we want to get the list, we want to look at actual Chinook numbers for these potential high priority dams, and we want to evaluate any new potential dams for the impact on Chinook and on Killer West. That's a pretty easy thing to forward. Um, those sorts of things, if there's, you know, the prioritization is going to happen because of number and because of timing. And so those sorts of things can then go forward as far as saying, hey, we're going to do this dam before this dam. It's not our job right now to fight this dam versus that dam as far as whether it's going to be the middle fork of the milk sack or the milk sack or the Allison dam or the Chambers Creek dam. That's an expert decision that's out of our hands as a task force. Our job is to make a clear-cut decision that we want to prioritize 
bringing them out that we don't need that are going to benefit Chinook and killer whales. And then also, as Will was saying, to evaluate any new dams before they come in, the same thing. We have no benefit in bringing down the Nooksack if this new dam that's going to come in is going to actually take out more Chinook than the wall just with that. Let's do it. My mind has been changed. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, then can't be good. <laughs> so I'm going to harp on this every time as far as the return on investment for the dollars. I mean, the legislature's eyes are going to play the I mean, I always think never, I actually say seven, but ten items don't be coming before. But part of it has to have like a dollar item to it. Because if one, okay, it's five light bulbs is all this damn powers and it already is off of litigation, but it still it needs this amount of funding and we can use this funding over here for a better time and place. We have to know what those numbers are because it's not the number of proposals going forward, it's also the dollars associated with that. I didn't so, expect that to come in any amount. I would think so, but I don't know what just went on it. Okay, so I'm just gonna sum up that so we can we have one more to try and get done in less than ten minutes. So um, we're Taking the tailors off for this year, potentially getting more information and considering it next year, not necessarily using this language about halting it, but to figure out to determine what the impacts and benefits are and the benefits are to work with it belong in this process. But I think there was agreement that it doesn't belong in the recommendations for this yeah, year. That's what I can yeah. Yeah. So uh, process question, habitat, hatcheries, we're gonna talk about that when next year. Okay. okay. Okay, so I, I think I, what I heard is that people are A, yes, would have started with these first three. Yes. Like in my mind, those the middle fork no site has already got money, it's already got a design, it go, go, go. Pillachuck, they they need to design, but otherwise it's a go. So it seems to me, and I know about Nelson Dam, so if you say support funding for currently reaches for a dam, starting with Middle Fork, Pillachuck, and Nelson. Yes. And, and then, 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 then no, we're going to prioritize list of all of the others. And, and then, Susan, I think I just want to make the point, point it's not just taking off the, the Chehalis, but say, investing, you know, having for every new proposed dam that we actually is being evaluated um, for that. And so that, no, that, every new proposed dam. Yeah, because we don't have any top. Oh, yeah, I that down on the Okay, thank you. But uh, Susan just kind of um, summarized a little bit less than that. Anything else on that? We have one more that I want to talk about. Okay, so the last one is um, it's, it's talking about trying to expedite the NEPA process. And, uh, and uh, what is that? On page five. On page five. So uh, what we understand is the National Environmental Policy Act and Associated Environmental Activity is ongoing, it's sponsored by the Corps and the lead agency on the operation of the Federal Columbia River Power System, FCRPS, 14 hydropower facilities, Columbia Basin Wide. Yeah. So um, the working group gave three options. One is requesting that the governor send uh, the Corps of Engineers a letter requesting that the process be expedited. Another one is requesting that the legal process and related biological decisions fully consider the impacts on the whales, the orcas, and, and there's more there. And then the third one was opposing any additional extension of time to complete uh, the NEPA review process. The, if you look at the notes um, from the working group, there's just concern that it's a federal process and the time have been set by court order, so just wanting to, you know, is there, What's the value of it's recommended that it's going to have value? So that was just a question that came up. Steve can say it more to you. Well, so just clarification. So this is not something that's costing us money to do. This is a process that's underway. We're just having like, the governor ask to ex expedite it because it could benefit the work that we're doing here. Is that right. Right? So of those three options, you like A the best then of requesting the governor send a letter? Uh, no, not necessarily. I was actually just reading the, the notes that were on that process. So, uh, so uh, the three do uh, those three options. There, do you have any? And is that? I mean, is that our only option, really? Well, there you have other options. options. There's three that the working group came up with, but you may come up with other ones. Mm -hmm. uh, Amy, this strikes me as sort of a, a, a very low effort and probably low effectiveness, but no reason not to do it because That's it's very low effort. Idea. So, in my mind, A, B, C, F. Recommend all three. Sure. It gets back to Senator Rickard's point, which is 
Hang on, but this doesn't go to the legislature. Jay, go do what you do, send off a letter, we're going to keep recording. It's all nice. Yeah, I think it's fine. I think it's fine. Okay, so do all three. Yeah, what you would say. Governor, do all three. What's that? Copy the voice. It's his discretion. No, hang on, hang on, hang on. If it's governor, does all three. So I'm imagining some sort of book coming from this body. This is going to be just like our OA task force and every other task force I've sat on. So we're going to have some beautiful book. And I don't want that beautiful book to go on my shelf in my office and no one ever reads it and no one ever implements it. So getting bold task force recommendations is not our goal. Getting those task force recommendations <coughs> implemented is our goal. And so even with, uh, I'm gonna point counterpoint what I just said. So I think you're making a good point. If we have a bunch of recommendations and some are for the governor and some are for the legislature, they're gonna be in the same damn book. And if it gets too thick, it gets too thick. So no, I don't think we should do all three. I think if there's one specific, recommendation like governor write a letter saying that we need to expedite the need to process fine but i don't want like anywhere we can anywhere we can we should be thinking about eliminating recommendations well in that case this is not going to hold in my opinion so, so get rid of it fine get rid of it entirely no benefit no effect let's do it it's horrible not i mean it's not really the same but it's like right we're just, we're just going to go through the motion. Yeah. And I don't yeah. mean that it's in the way, but it just means that we only have to ask people so much time. Right. Exactly. So we didn't have all the ideas that we chose not to advance as the most critical because of low effect. So along with that, another sort of process for the task force question, as opposed to the Senator Rachel's point about another binder that goes on the shelf, because you have space for that much room on your shelf. Is what's the process? Or can we can the task force recommend to the governor that there be a process that is checking on these recommendations and the status of the recommendations to make sure that they're <coughs> well, the ones that we recommend for you? Yeah, one. I mean, yeah. a process question for the full task force. Right. When we're doing the first set, uh, the first report for this year, we should say, and governor, we think there's value to having some structure that's going to be looking at the recommendations and saying, here's how we're doing it. Yeah. And I can answer, I mean, our year two work specifically says looking at you know, what's happened on the year one recommendation. But I think that the report will also include some of the, all the things that we want to do in year two, too. So you do have to choose whether you want this off altogether, delayed until year two, or if we should just have someone to catch all other good ideas that didn't quite meet the bar. Is that what you do? Yeah, that's entirely in that third bucket. Yeah. Yeah. The governor may look at it and just say, I'm going to do that. I think in year two, this body should do a report card on the governor and the legislature and give us an A, B, C, D, or F. There's nothing like putting a politician's feet on the wire shape. Yeah, before the second report. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like this time next year, we come back and we go, hey, put rank or can we create the same entities over the past two decades? Because we already know. <laughs> 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 I like that. Name names. That, that approach is also helpful if we take a look at why. And better understand why. The reason I bring that up now instead of this time next year is because I think we should be vocal about it. Hey, Glenn, by the way, we plan on doing a report card on here. Yeah, for one year report. On how good you do. Yeah. So, so we need to hold ourselves accountable for what is good optics. Is this going to be good optics? But it isn't that. No, I appreciate your point. No, I like just, throwing, uh, what was I yeah, putting in that other good idea. <laughs> that yeah. So just really quick before we break for lunch. Sorry. Steve just wants to, is going to just, you have a handout in your packet, you know, in front of you, on the things from the Craig Working Group that received broad support in the survey that we're sort of proposing that we move on, we're moving forward with that, and that just means that we continue to polish that up, put them on the list, and then you can decide which one is the worthy of attracting from your one top priority. That's the next meeting. Well, these. What, um, the, what the next meeting are more of the controversial ones or the ones where there was support and some opposition to really, you know, uh, jump into. The ones that are on this list, we're just asking for your blessing to continue to work on them. Yeah, feel free to provide written comments. Yeah, and they'll be, they'll just be in the draft um, list of recommendations that at some point you do need to winnow that down, which are the top ones that you want to go forward with. So, so as noted at the top of that handout, there, there, criteria by which an action is on a piece of paper is 80% of the task force members says yes or definitely yes to the action. So there was really strong support of those that appeared on there. And those, I think they span all of the different categories that are combined with us. So good work. I mean, that, that's a great start. We, that's 
That's nine. Yeah, yeah, they only do this at nine. And those are there's some very compelling. We're going to eliminate half of them. Right. So even if they're all not being supported, I agree. We're we're going to have to. And I think, and that's why our next step is to really try and give you all of them and yeah, what they're so package so that you can see, you yeah, need to see how they fit together and how they prioritize. And I was just going to say, so I can imagine a report where we're obviously going to have more than 10. Okay, there's too many people who care about too many things on the stand task force, so we're not going to have 10 recommendations. I can see a report, however, that has an executive summary and it says, these are our top 10 priority recommendations. There's another. 30 in the back of this book that you can care to read if you want to. But if you do nothing else, do these 10 things this year. So I'm not, I'm not part of the task force, so I'm sorry. Do you mind if I say no, just, just a few words? Um, you're a rock star. <laughs> <laughs> we're, uh, we're talking about what we're doing today and this year. Where we come from, Terry, Chairman, we do generational planning. And this long-term planning, Year two, the bucket list, the wish list is great. I, I, it's three or four year generational training. Um, I think what we need to do, uh, Stephanie, my thought is it would be nice to be able to encompass in your fourth section to say, we're doing seven generational training for Washington State. This isn't just, I'm now elected, so I'm now going to get it done. I'm now on a task force, so I'm now going to get it done. We're going to do what we've done since time and memorial. We're going to say, this is long term planning for generations. Um, and I think in your heart of hearts, all of you call this place home, you, you think the same way I do. Um, logistically, um, you know, can you get it done? Yes. Can you get the low hand food done? Uh, yes, Senator. Will they probably the state legislature give us a hard time? More than likely. But I think if we can find a way, Stephanie, to say, hey, we're doing this now, but our task force is thinking generationally in the board, in your board, in your board section, and we're going to continue this good work down the road, whether or not we're an elected official, whether or not we're sitting in an agency, but as citizens, we're all going to take this board in a good way. So I don't want to sound like I have amber sunglasses on, but I think, as you said, and I think all of you said, um, we're going to get something done, we're going to prioritize it, but we're going to also do year two, year three, year four, year five generational planning. And also we're going to be stuck here again uh, trying to find the sound science and the best science to try and, try and resolve an issue that we all got an F on for the past two decades. Mm -hmm. So just some thoughtful, fruitful thoughts to share with your party. Well, so thank you. And that was a very good way to close, I think, this um, session. So lunch will be uh, out here. We we're going to have a um, so short lunch break, and then we're going to just find a seat in there for public comment. So, yeah, sorry to come back, though, twice to come back.